Well, holy cow, we have reached episode 100 of the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. Now, I had hoped that we'd be in the launch year for the N64 by this time, but that is not the case, and that is due to a lack of looking ahead on my part. Um, instead, we are in the last major year for Super Nintendo, as we are covering Nintendo Power number 73 for June of 1995. Our cover game for this issue is Weapon Lord, with a painting of a fuzzy britches barbarian holding a giant club and wearing a mask that looks like the head of a saber-toothed ram? Not sure what to take of that. In the letters column, we have some more praise for the format change, though some readers want more comics, and the magazine has something coming for them. There's also one guy who wants more Console Wars smack talk, and please, please no. All of that nonsense, it's aged in incredibly poorly, so I'd rather not, thank you. Anyway, on the power charts, SimCity and Aerobiz Supersonic have returned the rankings, and Earthbound, Weapon Lord, and True Lies are new to the Super Nintendo chart. The Game Boy Top 10 has two new titles, Picross and Kirby's Dream Land 2, and finally joining the Hall of Fame are the NES versions of Battletoads and Mega Man 4. Oh, and the genre rating this issue is for puzzle games, which is unfortunately made exclusively of Super Nintendo and Game Boy games, so no adventures of Lolo here. We get additional coverage of Earthbound, which I've already reviewed. Probably more notable here than the main meat of the article is the profile of Shigesato Itoi, since Itoi is a writer whose work has very little penetration in the U.S. and, well, significantly more penetration in his home country. The article itself is a very high-level overview of where you go in the game, with the nitty-gritty being saved for the strategy guide that comes with it. Next up is Weapon Lord, a 2D weapon-based fighting game from Namco, which has very limited connections to the future Soul Calibur series, as Weapon Lord was developed by Visual Concepts, and the character designs were all done to evoke more Frank Verzetta and Boris Vallejo-inspired character designs, though some of the mechanics used here were adapted for use in the Soul Calibur Soul Edge series. Weapon Lord visually feels ahead of its time, like something closer to the PlayStation 1 era 2D fighters, like, well, the Street Fighter Alpha slash Street Fighter Zero games, and Street Fighter 3 Guilty Gear, that sort of thing. The characters in the game have profoundly detailed strikes with very, very intricate animations, along with a combat system that is stuff like a parry system well before it was implemented in the Street Fighter series. But due to the limitations of the Super Nintendo, it ends up making the game kind of busy, and ultimately makes it somewhat sluggish and unresponsive in ways that I don't believe is related to the emulator I'm using to capture gameplay footage. If it was, it would have come from lots of other fighting games I've played before and used for, the, for this show. Now, it's not that the game is bad. Not at all. It's just that the game feels like it would have fired much better had it come out later on again. The PS1 Saturn era of consoles, as opposed to uh, the Super Nintendo. Moving on, we have Star Trek Deep Space Nine, a side-scrolling adventure game based on the show with some cinematic platforming elements as well. We get some gameplay notes and maps, along with guides for the first few objectives. Star Trek Deep Space Nine has some problems with its learning curve and its lack of checkpoints. The game puts you in a scenario very early on where you're learning the controls, but it puts you with a time limit that initially comes out of nowhere, at a point where you're just trying to get the hang of the controls and learn your way around the station. And this time limit comes from a series of bombs that have been placed in the area of the station by Bajoran terrorists. Now, if they waited on starting the clock until when you first saw the terrorist planting the bomb, and a clock was put on screen to let you know how much time you had left, that'd be one thing. It would communicate information much better to the player and let you know, let you work your way up to this situation and let you know how well you're doing and give you something to work for in terms of, okay, let me get a better time next time, and that sort of thing. Instead, this game decide basically decides to be deliberately obtuse. I'm so interested in picking this game up and playing the rest of the way through it, but on the other hand, I feel this would be a game that I want to play in a device that incorporates some sort of emulation so I could save scum my way through the bullshit. 
Moving into the Epic Center section. In news, Tecmo is putting together an RPG called Secret of the Stars, with a leveling system that is different from other game, other games, but in ways that aren't explained particularly well at all. Also, Koei is working on a sequel to Pacific Theater of Operations. We start off with an extensive preview of Chrono Trigger. The game was already out in Japan, and the article gets into the multiple endings and New Game Plus option, along with its planned August release date in the U.S., so I'm going to hold off on reviewing it until later. Our first major guide is for Rise of the Phoenix, another Koei Grand Strategy game set in China in the 3rd century BC, before the Three Kingdoms period. Now, going through the article, it appears to play pretty close to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms and Nobunaga's Ambition games, which, as with those games, makes it for something of a tricky game to review. Much like those games, you don't get a lot of tutorializing in the game itself or how the mechanics work under the surface. Service. Much as with grand strategy games like the Europa Universalis series or Victoria or Hearts of Iron, you learn more to play about these games or how to play them, and thus in turn, if there's something you're interested in, by watching people who know what they're doing play the game and explain what they're doing, which makes it for a tricky review on my part. So I am going to give this something of a miss. Instead, I will look for a good Let's Play and put that in the show notes instead. Next up is a strategy guide for Illusion of Gaia, with some general tips, along with notes on where you can find all of the red jewels in the game. Moving on, we have a preview of the Super Nintendo version of Killer Instinct, talking about how uh, mechanically everything is pretty much identical to the arcade version and will include the Killer Cuts soundtrack. Moving on, we have Dirt Tracks FX, a motocross racing game for the Super Nintendo using the Super FX chip and polygonal graphics, but from a third-party developer. We get maps for most of the game's tracks. Dirt Track FX is an interesting racing game, as it's a 3D off-road racing game, one that accounts for... That. Dirt Tracks FX is an interesting racing game. It's a 3D off-road racing game, one that became significantly more popular as we got into the polygonal 3D era of the PlayStation and Saturn and one which also accounts for all the sort of track-skipping nonsense that you see used in, for example, Super Mario Kart speedruns. Actually, it accounts for it too well, because in this game it's incredibly easy to jump the track purely by accident, as opposed to the very intentional, deliberate, and planned track skips of Mario Kart speedrunners. I frequently found myself accidentally jumping over barriers, followed by having to spend way too much time going back over the way I came, so I can return to where I left the track by accident and continue with the race, at which point I've got passed by like five other people. That said, the rubber banding is generous enough that when this happens, you can get back up to second place pretty easily, should you screw, your, screw up in any particular manner. But taking first requires a perfect run, which is a royal pain to pull off because of all the issues with the physics caught you to jump over barriers by accident. It's, it's a novel for, um, execution of this concept. Not perfect, but it's, it's okay. Next, we have uh, Super Turrican 2, the second Turrican game for the Super Nintendo, with notes in each of the game's stages. Super Turrican 2 is a punishingly difficult running down game. Now, if you just look at the gameplay and screenshots, it would be a un, it would not be an unreasonable assumption to think, oh, this play is like Contra or Metal Slug. And you would be close to the truth. There's just one key flaw. The Contra and the Metal Slug games give you the ability to shoot at a 45 degree angle, either up or down, or particularly up allowing you to better manage the onslaught of enemies that you face, and it is a massive onslaught. On the other hand, Super Turrican 2 will throw the same number of enemies at you that Contra or Metal Slug will, but without the ability to shoot at a 45 degree angle. Apparently the developers thought this was totally unnecessary, or made the game too easy and decided to not include it. 
The problem is it makes this makes the only most effective gun in the game a spread shot because it's the only gun that can effectively shoot at a 45 degree angle above you, which means it's the only gun that's effectively useful against enemies coming from above. Which also means that any other weapon in the game just won't work for you, which is frustrating because like, there are some neat weapon power-ups in this game, and I'd like to experiment with them and find, you know, find a playstyle that works for me. Except, the game only has one playstyle that works. If you're if you're not using the spread shot, then you're not playing it the way the developers feel is the good way. Which would point, why have other shots than the spread shot? It's, it's frustrating. In the classified information column, we have a invulnerability code for Excalibur 2097 and a healing code for Death of Superman. The release of the Virtual Boy is nearly here, and we get notes on the launch lineup, along with additional information on how the device works. Again, due to issues on how the Virtual Boy itself works and lack of access to the original system, I am going to hold off on reviewing Virtual Boy games, and instead I will refer you to Jeremy Parrish's excellent Virtual Boy works series, there will be a link to it in the show notes. Moving on, we have Prehistoric Man, a port of a platformer for the Game Boy to the Super Nintendo. Normally, this goes the other way. Anyway, we get notes on the traversal power-ups before moving into level maps, starting with level 2. There are also notes for the next 12 stages through level 14, before getting a map of 15, and then, again, notes for another 8 levels. The Super Nintendo version of Prehistoric Man is... okay. While Titus has had more than a few stinkers, and will have several to come, this is not one of them. It doesn't have the floaty jump physics that come from Amiga ports or from developers who are primarily familiar with making platformers on the Amiga, showing that they're getting comfortable designing games for the Super Nintendo, both from a hardware standpoint and from a control standpoint. That said, this is coming very late in the console's lifespan, so I can't help but feel, but feel that this is too little too late. And all of this is help, not helped by the fact that this is an otherwise bog-standard platformer. It's not that it's not fun, it's certainly an enjoyable game. It's just that there are so many other games that do so much more and so much better. Moving on, we have Izzy's Quest for the Olympic Rings, a platformer with the mascot of the Atlanta Summer Olympics. And we get a handful of level notes. So, Izzy's Quest for the Olympic Rings does wrong almost everything that the Super Nintendo version of Prehistoric Man does right. Floaty jumping, an awkward damage model, it even screws up a few things by, well, new things, by having random drops in levels that you trigger by jumping near them without any indication that they're, there, that they're there, and having some be beneficial and some do damage more or less at random. I'll just say, it's less a new thing as much as an old thing repurposed for a new console generation. Specifically, this is the kind of stuff that would come up a lot in early NES games, or I should say, early Famicom games, which got ported to the NES. However, by the end of the NES era, those mechanics had been left by the wayside for good reason. They're not good. Here, at the other hand, it's really bring, we're, we're bringing it back because, because I honestly don't know. The one thing it does do right is it keeps the somewhat linear and directed nature of Prehistoric Man, as opposed to, because this is from a European developer, US Gold, taking the more aimless, undirected model that would come from other mega games, like, for example, the Atomus Family titles. It's still a bad game and absolutely not worth your time. In Counselor's Corner, we get answers for questions about Brandish and True Lies. Next up, Nintendo has partnered with Life Fitness to put out a Super Nintendo exercise peripheral, or rather, I should say, exercise bike peripheral. Uh, re Rays actually did a video on this a while back. Um, it's a really good one, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Moving into this issue's Game Boy game, we have Jungle Strike, a Game Boy port of the sequel to Desert Strike. There are notes on the first mission and full maps for the second through sixth missions. The Game Boy version of Desert Strike is unfortunately not as good an adaptation of the Super Nintendo game as the Game Boy version of Desert Strike was. This isn't helped by the fact that the opening mission of Jungle Strike is something of a hunt mission, as your objectives are a lot less transparent in terms of where you need to go to complete them. So there's a lot of, lot of error to go with the trial on this, 
I would recommend just sticking with the Super Nintendo version. In the now playing column among the also rans are the fishing game Bassmasters, and then the Game Boy versions of Flintstones the Movie and True Lies. In our Pentultimate article this issue, we have a look at the actual chassis of the Nintendo 64 in its more or less final design, save for the name, and the note that will be out in one year. Finally, in the Pack Watch column, we have notes on a Dr Judge Dredd movie licensed game for the Super Nintendo, along with Phantom 2040. Next month, we have Donkey Kong Land. My pick of the issue is Super Turrican 2. As much as I'd like, like to pick DS9 for this one, a Star Trek game that dissuades the player from immersing itself in, the, in its world from the get-go is a significant strike against it. Also, I will say that I do like, like, Turrican 2, or Super Turrican 2, rather, does have its improvements over the original. It does have more directed degree of gameplay to it. It's just... It's a game that you sh that should be allowing the player a level of freedom in firing to something like Contra, considering it's doing its similar gameplay to Contra, but the failure to do that is a significant strike against it, but it still manages to be the best game of this issue. Such, is, such as it is. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.